Welcome everyone to the Wall Street Blockchain Alliance Crypto Policy Update. This is our inaugural episode, uh, live streaming on LinkedIn Live and Twitter. Sorry, Elon X, apologies. Uh, live streaming uh, to you uh, with our colleagues here. My name is Ron Quarant, the chair of the Wall Street Blockchain Alliance. Uh, before we begin, a couple of really quick disclaimers. Obviously, for this session, please keep in mind that nothing discussed is accounting, investment, legal, or tax advice, and that all of the views expressed by us uh, and our expert panelists and speakers are, are their personal opinions, and uh, I suspect don't represent the opinions of the WSBA or their respective firms. Uh, and please do also keep in mind, we have chat available, so if you're watching us on LinkedIn Live or Twitter, please submit your questions. Our experts will get to them and we'll do the best we can. But let me stop talking. Dina, please say hello to the audience and introduce yourself, and then we'll go to Adam as well. Sure, I'm Dina Ellis Rockhind. I um, work at Paul Hastings in the fintech practice, and I spent most of my career on Capitol Hill in health financial services and Senate banking. And nothing that I say today is on behalf of Paul Hastings or any of our clients. Mr. Goldberg, please say hello. Hi, uh, my name is Adam Goldberg, and I am the regulatory subject matter expert for the Network and Regulatory Solutions Division at S&P Market Intelligence. Um, similar to Dina, I worked on the Hill in both the House and the Senate for two of the drafters of the Dodd-Frank legislation, uh, Rep. Barney Frank and uh, the late deceased Senator Levin um, as a law clerk on the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, in addition to working for his personal office. And prior to following the Hill, I've gone into industry and done a variety of compliance functions since then, including my current role. And um, I will echo Ron's disclaimer that nothing I say today um, should be reflected as the views of S&P Global. They are certainly my views and to share with the audience. Dina, Adam, thanks so much. It's a privilege. I've had the opportunity. Uh, you're both members. Your firms are members, and it's a great privilege. Uh, we've been in a lot of meetings, and we really speak to many of the issues that we're seeing in the crypto space. So, Adam, let's kind of dive in. WSBA is not a lobbying organization, um, as you both know, but we really do work to educate and represent the voice of industry. Um, I want to start with some of the legislative stuff that we talked about, particularly house-related. Adam, do you want to dive into some of the McHenry stuff? And I know someone's desperately trying to reach Dina. I suspect, but Adam- I apologize. Uh, one of my apps, I cannot get it to turn off, but I apologize. No worries. Adam, <laughs> let's dive into it. Like, what's the current status of some of the legislative efforts that are happening there? And there are a lot of them, but top of mind for me, the current standing on the McHenry bill, let's talk about the stablecoin stuff. What are you seeing on the Hill? So I think the most important pr action probably happened over the summer before we got to break when um, Chair McHenry, the Republican chair of the House Financial Services Committee, decided to move forward with a market infrastructure bill related to crypto assets. Yeah. One of the important parts about that markup is it was one of the rare bills that was able to achieve some bipartisan support. There were a number of Democrats within the committee that voted for the legislation after certain amendments they had sought were adopted. This has been opposed to some of the other approaches that Chair McHenry has had. Um, for example, on stablecoin legislation that Ron had mentioned, they did desire to try and get a bipartisan agreement with Chair Waters um, and try to get a bipartisan agreement through the committee. This is something they have sought for almost two years now, um, while both while Chair Waters and the Democrats were in charge and now with ha Chair McHenry. Those did not um, come to fruition, it seems, because of some opposition to by the White House to certain provisions. At least that is what McHenry attributes to. And saying that, he has now moved forward in a solely um, GOP direction with his bills. So he brought forward the stablecoin legislation that he had brought forward, and they voted on a number of additional bills. So, for example, today there was certain stablecoin legislation to prevent the Federal Reserve from producing a CBDC or marketing it directly to customers. So there's a lot of action going on in the House right now, and there have been a number of bills that have moved out of committee. What is a little less unclear right now is as to whether those bills are actually going to get a full House floor vote. As we've seen, it's been quite difficult for Speaker McCarthy even to bring appropriations bills to the floor and have a functional majority. So one of the reasons I highlight the market infrastructure bill is the fact that it has some bipartisan support may give it a better chance of actually reaching the floor and may potentially get a vote. And I know there's a big industry lobbying effort next week to try and show up on the Hill and put their weight behind that particular bill to see if they can get a vote on it. Dina, weigh in on that a little bit if you could. And I want to I want to rip up the script just a little bit, which you will both learn I tend to do. We'll get a better host view in the future as well. But Adam, you said something really interesting. You know, uh, part of the market infrastructure work that McHenry was pushing forward um, had bipartisan support. 
we don't often hear that vis-a-vis -vis crypto. So Dina, weigh in on why that might be important. And what are the real battle lines? Like, I guess the question I often get, Dina, is how powerful is the anti-crypto army? And we know I'm referencing Senator, Sen Senator Warren, but I'd love you to weigh in on that. I mean, sure, there's always been um, some supporters on the House side, particularly um, in the, you know, the Congressional Blockchain Caucus, which was, you know, a, con con uh, a creation early in terms of when the industry started to come up on the Hill. And so you always are going to get that bipartisanship. The issue in the House is that um, there hasn't been the level of support necessary from uh, the ranking member, Maxine Waters, who is the lead Democrat on the House Financial Services Committee. And, you know, typically the leadership, so, um, you know, Pelosi and others in the leadership typically follow her lead uh, when it comes to financial services. I am optimistic that the legislation um, in both the market structure and I think the stablecoin legislation as well, it mm. does have the votes to pass the House. Um, and it will likely pass on a bipartisan basis. It won't be one that's um, like a 400 or something, but it'll be, you'll probably get around 30 Democrats that vote for it. And then the question becomes, does that build any momentum um, as we go into the Senate at all? Because sometimes when bills pass overwhelmingly, depending on the dynamics to which are, as you know, change all the time, um, it can add... Um, it can sometimes add momentum to the legislative process. I, I, Dina, thanks so much. Adam, I, I want to ask you one thing, and you referenced something that's really interesting. I, I was having a conversation this morning, uh, and a colleague had mentioned, none of this matters if McCarthy can't bring forward um, a budget bill. Uh, is that true, or am I kind of not understanding the calendar of how it works at the House? Well, so usually for things like this, really one of their most viable paths, if you can't get a standalone vote on a specific bill, is to try and get it shoehorned into the appropriations process. If you can get it in one of these minibuses or omnibuses or continuing resolutions, you could usually sneak a particular provision in, and that may be a vehicle to get it passed in both the House and the Senate. But again, if, if you have difficulty even just funding the government and not shutting it down, that normal horse trading that may go on within the appropriations process, that makes it more difficult. And also, I think probably the concerns you heard, Ron, is clearly Kevin McCarthy is the Speaker of the House, but he does not have a functional operating majority as, let's say, former Speaker Nancy Pelosi had, where she had the same five-seat majority, but you were confident if she brought a bill to the floor, it would pass solely on Democratic votes, even with that narrow majority. One of the problems Speaker McCarthy has with his very narrow majority is usually on any bill he brings to the floor, especially related to spending, he usually has some hard no votes prior to even the bill being on the floor which undercuts his functional majority. And therefore, if he doesn't have Democratic votes to go along with it, then sometimes he can't even pass the rule to get on the bill. That's an esoteric term, but in the House, you must first set the rules of debate prior to actually debating the bill. Yeah, can I, can, I, I want to, I feel I Dina say, wanting I, to respond. Yeah, I wanted to step in. So I will say that in the, I've worked, worked both in the House and the Senate for 15 plus years. So in the House, it's very easy to walk and chew gum. So yes, you do have the overhang in the House. The problem, I've been around for many of these government shutdowns going all the way back to the one um, with Newt Gingrich. I was in a Maryland office, so you can imagine those federal employees weren't very happy that they weren't getting paid. So I know what it's like. It never goes very well for Republicans, unfortunately. Um, so, but in the House, everything is done either by rule or suspension of the rule. Let's keep it simple. But the House certainly, um, can pass the legislation when it comes to um, cryptocurrency because all of the rules are set before you get to the House floor. And so it doesn't take up a lot of floor time to pass some of those other bills. The question then becomes the Senate. And the Senate, because you need the 60 vote threshold to have legislation passed, that's a very difficult threshold to meet. Um, you, need, you need bipartisanship, which I'm not sure the 60 votes are there to pass yeah. something like this in the Senate. but the Senate also, um, because of the fact that you need, um, you know, the 60 votes and you need people to work on a bipartisan basis, legislation in the Senate um, can take for um, weeks to get off of the Senate floor. And so a lot of times things um, will wind up or pieces of things may go into what we call um, moving vehicles or must pass bills. 
the one thing I'll, I'll, I will say on the appropriations process, and I do think that they'll want the appropriations process to be fairly clean. When I say clean, not so much in it, except for, you know, what the spending levels are going to be, or maybe permanent continuing reg resolutions. But um, sometimes you get some provisions in the spending bills that says, um, I'm sure everyone would like this one. Um, the SEC cannot do anything when it comes to whatever rule it is that you um, are not happy with, whether it's uh, I've got private funds on my mind. Um, so right. you know, they cannot implement certain things. And those will be difficult things to get in. But you, you never know. Like if there's something I saw bipartisan um, angst about the open end funds rule yesterday. And, and so those are the kinds of things that can kind of slip in. Dina, thanks so much. It's a really great segue uh, to one of the items that uh, you both put together in the agenda. And thank you both so much for that. Let's move to the Senate perspective. And you both know I'm not a Washington person. And again, WSBA is not a lobbying organization. We don't hire lobbyists. That being said, there's always this perspective that colleagues and members, particularly in front which is House kind of flexible, there's stuff moving, maybe something works. And then Senate very entrenched on their camps of pro or anti-crypto. So I'm thinking Lummis Gillibrand, for example. I'm thinking uh, Senator Warren's anti-money laundering uh, proposal. Adam, is, is that a, an accurate perspective? Like there's there's flexibility in the House, but the Senate, they've really drawn battle lines in the crypto world. Um, I would say yes and no. I mean, I think there are some clear lines in the House as well. If you go to the Shermans of the world that are very anti-crypto, there are particularly skeptics. I think one thing that's notable in the Senate is, as Dina said, because the senators are well aware that nothing's going to move without 60 votes, they very much try to start out from a bipartisan position, usually rather than in the House, as long as you have your majority, you can pass pretty much whatever you want. As Dina said, you can move very quickly, you could suspend the rule, you can pass something. In the Senate, without 60 votes, no matter how much everyone supports a bill, as we've seen numerous times over the past couple decades, that bill might not even get a vote on the floor. So one thing to note about the, some of the bills you mentioned, there's the um, Elizabeth Warren's the Gillette Money Laundering Act. There is also a national security, um, crypto asset national security enhancement and enforcement act that's coming out of the Armed Services Committee. Both of those pieces of legislation have bipartisan sponsorship from both Democrats and Republicans. That is also true of Lummis Gildebrand, but one thing to note on Lummis Gildebrand is it came out with a lot of fanfare uh, a couple of years ago when they first announced yep. it. They have not been able to grow their coalition for that bill, mm -hmm. which again yeah. can point to some difficulties in adding sponsors to try and reach that 60 vote threshold. Some of these other anti-money laundering national security provisions, those generally by, are easier to garner bipartisan support generally when you're dealing with national security, because sure. you can say, I'm helping fight crime, I'm helping fight terrorist financing, I'm enforcing sanctions. So there is a possibility that you could see some of those bills that even though they may be somewhat more anti-crypto, anti-friendly for the sector, those may move. As you saw in a couple of years ago, there was a provision slipped into the bipartisan infrastructure bill around reporting of digital assets for digital asset brokers. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons that made it in is because it was part of what was called the Anti-Money Laundering Act, which was included in that bill as, again, for national security concerns, trying to fight money laundering. And this was a tax reporting provision to help pay for that, but also to help give information to the Treasury. Yep. If you can have a national security angle, that's usually a really good way to achieve bipartisan support in the Senate. So that's one thing the industry should be aware for. If some of these bills start to snowball and get more bipartisan support, they could potentially move in a way that the McHenry market infrastructure bill or the stablecoin bill, if you're not able to see that critical mass of bipartisan support, yeah. if you can't chart your path to 60 pretty much, then you're not gonna get floor time in the Senate because it's so valuable. They're gonna use it for nominations and for other things. And it's just gonna make that legislative path much tougher unless you do what Dina said, which is you attach it to a must pass bill. Right. You know, I, I think I should step in there. So, I mean, I will, okay, first of all, I think the Lamas Gillibrand effort is important. Regardless of whether it passes, it, you know, it creates a dialogue. The two of them have worked very hard on it. One, you know, Gillibrand's on the Agriculture Committee. Senator Lamas has been a champion. She's on the House, on the Senate Banking Committee. And even if it's not going to pass, what they're the work that they're doing and the input that they're um, getting 
it, it is a dialogue, but it also um, can have an influence on the way the agencies are thinking. Um, so I think all the movement on the Hill, which may seem like a lot of noise, if you're inside the Beltway, you understand that there's some level of interconnection and some level of coordination between the agencies and Capitol Hill. In terms of the AML and the national security types of provisions, I, I would probably um, be go even further than Adam, and that is that the National Defense Authorization Act, which is what funds are, which is what plans out how we're going to spend our military um, money, and then we have the defense appropriations language, which is part of the budget we're all talking about that are being have been being discussed over the last weeks. Um, that will there's a, a high chance that something will be included, um, especially since Senator Lummis and some other uh, very pro crypto uh, mem senators um, have signed on to um, versions of that. So I see that as something that is very live and and a decent chance of becoming law. And, and I'll just run, just let me add yeah, one word to what Dina said about that particular bill. It should be noted that that Defense Authorization Act has never been successfully filibustered. It has passed every single Congress. Even President Trump, when he was leaving office, vetoed that and it garnered over 67 votes to override the veto. Again, because you're essentially voting for funding for the troops and typically you're voting on military pay raises, usually costing living adjustments and other things to pay for troops. Yep. That it is very hard not to support that legislation on the floor. So as Dina said, if it makes it into that process of getting in the NDAA, or the accompanying appropriations bill for the Defense Department, it has a very strong p chance of surviving the legislative process and making it to the president's desk. I mean, NDAA always passes. I, I work for a member yeah. on it. So it's not a if, it's a, a when. Yep. It, it's, it's never been a passed piece of legislation. It, sometimes it like falls into, a, you know, it, it drags, but it always becomes law. Yeah, I wanted to note that, that that's the, the ultimate must pass. Even when you've seen government shutdowns and fu fighting yeah. over the national debt, you ne almost never see the NDA stopped. It will always pass in some form. I, I feel like you, you are both so knowledgeable. This is always the sausage making that 99% of the people in America don't know. I want to address, again, thank you all for joining us, uh, Dina, Adam, always a pleasure. I want to address Larry's question, another WSBA member. Shout out to Larry Miller. Thanks for joining us. He mentions, uh, and, and I know we're not going to go too deeply in some of the court cases. We might address them in future episodes a bit, but I want to see if either of you are interested in this. If the coin, if the Coinbase case in the Southern District of New York, do you think it would help build support for Lummis Gillibrand? You know, I, the idea being that if the SEC loses that particular case, do you have, either of you have a thought yeah. on that? Yeah, sure. I, I don't want to sp um, speak to any specific cases except for ones maybe that have happened, and and that is, I think that the, um, you know, I think the Uniswap case. Um, mm is a pretty significant one and that they wouldn't certify the class. And that it is the same judge that is going to be hearing, um, that it will be hearing that um, um, the this decision um, when we mentioned this particular company. Right. And um, we know that there have been, in, you know, over the last couple of years, there has really been this challenge to agency authority. And the Supreme Court is hearing a number of those cases, one on the CFPB uh, this fall, and, and so, yes, it's as, as somebody who's mostly worked on the legislative side as I have been, you know, uh, a lobbyist. It's hard to say this, but um, sometimes in this instance, uh, the courts are the best way to go. And if the SEC or the other agencies either are told they don't have the authority or feel like they may not have the authority, uh, that would certainly have a an impact in terms of pushing legislation forward on the Hill. Yeah, I would just note one note of caution there. Um, if the courts become a viable avenue to challenge regulation and for companies like Coinbase and some of the other players in the space to win, that does make their incentive to push legislation less. Not to say they won't, because I think everyone wants clear rules of the road, and I think everyone thinks it would benefit. But if, for example, if let's say Coinbase were to lose or some of these cases, let's say the, the Ripple case, which obviously was positive for Ripple at the district court level, the SEC has fired an interlocutory appeal to yep. block that and potentially reverse the decision prior to the, to the trial starting, which again is a rare procedural step that mostly lawyers know. But basically in these examples, if the industry were to win, 
they basically say, great, well, we've gotten clear guidance from courts, we can move forward. And then the need for legislation is not as great. Whereas sometimes if you get an adverse court case and it looks like the court is not a viable avenue to challenge the current set of regulations, mm -hmm. then it really makes you to push your policymakers and push your regulatory agencies to really come up with something. But it, it's not always the case. It could be a win. Well, I, would, I would say that it's different because um, people on the Hill, um, you know, and I have a, I have been involved with a lot of pieces of legislation that have become law going back to, um, to Graham Leach Bliley. And um, people on the Hill, they like to legislate. That's what they do, right? And so if a court has a decision that says the SEC doesn't have the authority and that this is in the purview of Congress, I think that Congress would take that very seriously and want to move forward with legislation. The only hitch I see that could... Um, and I don't want to be um, scare people, but the, the one hitch I do see is the Financial Stability Oversight Council mm. or the Financial Stability Board. So you can win. Let's say you go to something and you get the Supreme Court to say that, you know, this is a very new and different type of technology where you're, you know, you're sort of monetizing the building of the Internet and it needs a different set of rules. Um, you still have that the outlying um, problem of the Financial Stability Oversight Council potentially um, labeling a particular company or activity as systemically important. Right. Dina, Adam, thank, thank you both. I just want to be cognizant of time. Uh, and I want to ask one abstraction of that conversation. And, and let me give you the background on this. I had a conversation with some colleagues, legal colleagues, folks that have been in law for 30, 40 years plus, and I mentioned this conversation around the courts like we just had. And I said, it looks like the courts might be um, able to move some of this forward or at least be part of the solution. And he said something really interesting to me, which was the courts will always defer to the regulators. I guess the question becomes, has that historically been true? And are we seeing a, a judicial shift in perspective? Or is it really the case that courts will push back on regulators that they see, quote unquote, overreaching? Well, I, I think it, it, there's multiple aspects to that question. I would say generally right. for the last couple of decades, that has been true. And that's because of something known as Chevron deference, which um, Scalia and some of the conservatives on the court came up as initially a way to kind of limit agency authority. But really what it ended up doing was giving a lot of deference to regulatory agencies, which basically say if a regulator has a well-founded belief that they're what they're doing is within the guise of their statute. They're the experts. They should be able to determine. And as long as you could stretch it back to a particular statute, you give deference to the agency. That particular doctrine has come under fire in a number of recent Supreme Court cases. It has not particularly, it has not yet received five votes on the Supreme Court to overturn it. But there is a corollary doctrine which has come up recently in some cases, and it's particularly in the SEC context related to some of the decisions they would make. The SEC would have these arbitration panels where they basically have an SEC appointed administrative law judge would hear certain appeals. They found that that was basically too much SEC self-dealing using what's called the major questions doctrine. This is a relatively new doctrine that this Supreme Court has come up with, which basically says that if it's a very important major question, Congress should really weigh in. They're not comfortable with the regulators determining the scope of their power on a major question. This is really something that you should have more directly traceable to the people through a vote in Congress. So that is one thing that we should be aware of. That's one, of, the industry has really latched on to that, hoping yeah. that they can get a major questions doctrine ruling saying that you need crypto legislation from Congress before the SEC can act in this way because it's a major question. One thing I would just note there is it has not yet been applied to an agency rulemaking or an agency rule. It was applied to this administrative law judge process that the SEC uses, but not yet applied to an actual rule that an agency has created. So we do have to yep. see how that develops. If it were to be applied to agency rules, it could open up a whole can of worms to challenging certain rules that regulate forward. Adam, thanks. Dina, thanks. I, Dina, I want to go back to you. And I was thinking back, and I, my memory is escaping me, but I remember a conversation we had uh, when the presidential working group on digital assets put forward their requirements across the regulatory agencies, January of 21, 22, it's all starting to, to blur for me. And I remember a whole bunch of members of the WSB and colleagues across the industry said, oh, this is really interesting. There's going to be a whole of government approach. And you were Nostradamus, Dina. You looked at me and you said, no, this is not going to go the way 
you think, and I'm ripping up the script a little bit, um, <laughs> but but that kind of working group, the presidential working group, it kind of played out the way you, I don't want to say predicted, but the way you tried to tell us. So it brings me to the regulators. And, you know, this will not be a let's beat up on crypto's favorite um, you know, whipping boy uh, and Chair Gensler in the SEC. There are challenges and issues there. But when we when we look at regulatory action, uh, for example, uh, Chairman Gensler is going to be testifying next week at House Financial Services. What are your perspectives on progress on the regulatory front? It's always CFTC seems to be quiet, some DeFi actions, for example. But the SEC is really galloping forward on some stuff. I just wanted to give our audience, what's that picture like? I mean, sure. So I always say, um, well, first of all, you know, the SEC has been putting out um, a, a, a ton of regulations at a very fast pace. And um, and it doesn't just I know crypto, the industry sometimes feels like, why is it us? But it's really not. I haven't seen this the level of volume. And um, I would say, you know, on uh, Gary Gensler, I have a great amount of respect for him. I have known him since he was at Treasury. And um, I actually worked on eSign with him and a lot of the, if, this will give you sort of his technological perspective, a lot of the exceptions um, in the eSign bill um, were discussions between him and I where he was like, don't you think you should receive recall notices in the mail? I was like, no, I'm using my, my email all the time. But by, <laughs> but anyway, my point is, on, on Gary Gensler, he's, um, you have to think of him as somebody who, um, look at his time at the CFTC with derivatives. He enhanced the jurisdiction of, regardless of whether you like the outcome or not, he certainly left a legacy with the CFTC and empowered it in terms of derivatives. Mm. And I think in the SEC as it is today, you know, your time in these like high level um, positions is limited as an appointee. And so Gensler wants to get done as much as he can. And to the extent that he can have as much jurisdiction over uh, cryptocurrencies and blockchain, which is really the future of financial services. And as you know, he's been talking about AI as well, yep. right? Um, I know you want where you, where you want me to go. Um, all of that is very significant. However, as I said, you cannot judge a book by its cover. And if you think about this a little bit more, I mean, it's the obvious kind of, obviously the U.S. Um, government is going to be the most about worried about national security and a large component of and also um, monetary policy and a large component of um, our national security is done because it's done through the dollar being the reserve currency in the world. And so who would be the most the agencies the most worried about that? That would be the Treasury Department, right? Because they have FinCEN, they like have to manage the government's debt. We're all talking about the budget. I don't envy the Treasury Department right now in terms of what they have to do. So I would see Treasury as your key player, um, which Treasury, and then I would see the, the Federal Reserve as well as your two key players. So I would see the people that I would watch more closely, even though they don't have the same um, kind of Gensler type of approach. Gensler is kind of like what you see is what you get, very blunt, you know, he's, where he's going. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say that you really need to watch closely the movements of um of you know Secretary Yellen, um, yeah. of course Chair Powell, but I would say more. Um, I would say more the um, Michael Barr, who's the Vice Chair of Supervision. Yep. I think they're calling the the larger shots in the scheme of things. Dina, thanks so much. I just we're coming up on. We've only got a few minutes left. We're going to go a little over uh, two thirty. I want to give Adam you an opportunity to weigh in on the regulatory perspectives, and 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 in further episodes we'll dig into deeper issues and more detail on the regulatory landscape, but. Is crypto looking at the regulatory perspectives wrong? I don't think they're looking at it wrong. I think it's just one thing that I think we need to be mindful of. And I think it's unfortunate for the sector. I think there was a lot of hope in the last couple of years that we may actually get some regulations from some of the agencies, even from Chair Gensler. There was a custody rule that the SEC put out that did specifically mention digital assets. That the, the that was one area where we were hoping to get some clarity from regulators as to what you could do and from a custody perspective. Unfortunately, the SEC pulled back that rule, and when they reissued it, they specifically omitted the part that mentioned digital assets. So it seems that there is a policy directive to specifically not make formal rules and regulations around crypto and digital assets. And that, 
again, we don't know if this is a formal policy, but that may be an administration-wide position because we have not really seen many of the regulators put forward any formal regulations around the crypto or digital asset sector that would be noted. It, it would go into what's called the notice and rulemaking comment process. If you issue a formal rule, industry is, or really anybody is allowed to comment on that rule. And the agency has to provide detailed feedback to the comments that they get. And those comments can then be reviewed in litigation if the rule is challenged. So yeah. one of the reasons you've likely not seen the regulators put forward formal rules or be forward leaning is they're afraid of an adverse precedent in a court related to a rule they propose. They'd much rather fight it out. And what you're seeing this policy of strategic ambiguity or regulation by enforcement, whatever you call it. Right. They would much rather take on individual bad actors and put forward what their view of the law is and then have a court try and slap them down. And usually one of the reasons they go that way is because then they could bring in all the facts and circumstances of that particular bad actor. So yes, you're having these discussions as to what the law says, but if you're going after a particular bad actor that's let's say stole $4 billion from somebody when they said they were creating a coin and then never did it, well, you look good from an agency perspective going after that bad actor and you might get a sympathetic judge. Usually these cases don't go to jury, they're usually bench trials. But that is one of the unfortunate things that's happened in the last couple of years is we've not seen that formal rulemaking process and it's not been mandated by Congress. And mm -hmm. as we're going into an election year of 2024, it is quite unlikely that we either get formal legislation just given the dynamics in Congress. There may be discrete pieces that I'm sure Dina would love to talk about. We may get something on stable coins. We may get something on Andy Monday laundering. There may be specific areas we get, but that kind of overall bill that would set the rules of the road for digital assets or set formally what the SEC's jurisdiction is versus the CFTC's jurisdiction, those may not come. And I think Dina correctly points out the risk that if we get nothing, the Financial Stability Oversight Council created by the Dodd-Frank Act, chaired by the tre by the Treasury Secretary, has mentioned that they view stable coins and other digital assets to be pose potential systemic risk. That would be a basically a justification for them to then put forward their own rules once they designate a certain companies as as being systemically risky, and they're on very strong ground legislatively to do that. Go ahead, Dina, wrap it up. We've all, we've I'm going to wrap it up. So I, I think uh, that this is playing out a little bit differently. So I do worry about the FSOC or the Financial Stability Board, which is a whole other conversation. But, you know, what I'm witnessing, and I, I don't work in-house at any of these companies, but I, when I look at the number of traditional finance companies that have entered in this space, I say, wait a minute, these are companies that work every, some of them have examiners in their office. They work every single day with the, um, you know, with their regulators. And I don't think a lot of them would make um, broad announcements about getting into this space if they didn't feel comfortable doing so and didn't have some kind of blessing or maybe some kind of push to get into the space. So yes, I, I want to see new companies. I want to see competition. However, I do think that um, crypto in some form and blockchain technology is here to stay and that once the U.S. feels a sense of comfort about maintaining our role as the, with the dollar as a reserve currency and with national security, I see us beginning to see a shift. And we're getting close to that. We're not there yet, but I think we are getting close to that point. So, Dina, you raise a really interesting point, and our members within the WSBA as a trade association are traditional finance companies, are um, responsible innovators in this space across fintech and, and crypto and, and beyond. <clears throat> Pardon me. And certainly, we all agree to the importance of national security concerns. We agree to the importance of anti-money laundering compliance and investor protections. But I want to ask a question that might be a bit more provocative than I mean it to be. But is this the government picking winners? And what I mean by that is it really pushes a lot of the capabilities back to, to traditional financial services firms. And that's what we're hearing. What are your yeah. thoughts? Yeah. I, do think, I do think that it, um, yes, in some way it is. And I don't think just because a company is big versus a startup, I mostly work with startups because I'm kind of unique in what I do at my firm, but I don't think a big company is any bigger than a small company. And I think we need um, competition. In this instance, and I don't think the government should pick winners and losers, and you could say the same thing about the, you know, the FTC trying to break up Google or whatever, right? Sure. So I don't think that they should be. In this instance, I'm not saying that they should be, 
but I think this is a bigger issue in terms of um, the national security of the United States, the mm. reserve currency as uh, the dollar remaining the reserve currency. And um, look at the geopolitics that are going on in this world right now. And, and so it's a little different. Uh, Dina, thanks. Adam, weigh in and we're going to wrap it up. Yeah, well, actually, that's one area I want to end on a somewhat hopeful note. With building on what Dina said, yes, the, the, there may be picking of winners and losers, but may not exactly how people think. Mm -hmm. So let's say, for example, if they were to approve the Black Coin, the BlackRock Bitcoin ETF, that, that obviously would be picking a winner. You have one of the largest asset managers that wants to offer a fund. That would be a particularly picking a winner. But one thing I would say as a hopeful note is the rest of the world's not waiting for America. The Euro European Union has passed the markets and crypto assets regulation. It starts to go in next year with the stablecoin provision. Its formal registration regime for digital asset companies comes in the following year. The FCA in England is following suit. In Japan, they already have crypto and digital asset regulations. And there's a number of other Asian markets that have already moved forward, such as Hong Kong. So one thing to note is as these regimes start up globally, it will put pressure on the United States, but also when we're dealing with uh, international finance, many of these companies operate across borders. And to understand the different regulations that you have to comply with in many different countries, it's a very particular type of business that has the kind of legal compliance support that's able to do that. So in a sense of picking winners and losers, you may not be picking winners and losers formally, but given the complexity of just operating in a legal and compliant manner, that may push it more towards the traditional financial industry because they have already all those capabilities already because they already operate in all those regimes and have to follow all those rules. So if I they just have to another set. I just want to point out one little thing about all of that, which is, um, and I'm going to see how it sounds very nationalist, and I don't mean to, but I'm, I'm first and second generation. I worked in Congress. This is, I love this country. So, you know, for those who will say, well, the U.S. is behind, right? Well, we certainly weren't behind in the innovation. Most of a lot of these companies were U.S. companies, right? Some good, some bad. But the companies that have become involved in the crypto and blockchain space, um, not just only financial services, but we have tech companies that have been brought yep. in that are they are companies that are based in the U.S. that have a footprint globally. And so for those that think that the U.S. is behind, yeah, in certain ways, but I don't think so much. And I am very optimistic that we will have some, some of the crypto companies that exist today will continue on. And I, I think we'll have new entrants um, in the U.S. like we always have. Yeah, we still have the strongest, most liquid capital markets in the world. The dollar is the strongest currency in the world. People want to put their money here. And that's the most important thing, regardless of how long it takes to put rules in place. This will always be the destination for capital, at least in the near term. Clearly, that can change over the course of decades. But right now, people want to invest in the United States. And that's including in the digital asset space, which is what Dina is alluding to. Thank you, Dina, Adam. Thank you both. I can talk to the two of you for hours about this topic. We're a little bit over time. I don't even think we got to the entirety of our agenda. We'll pick some more up next month. Thank you all for watching and joining us. Tune in again next month. We'll be posting that on LinkedIn Live uh, as well as on X uh, or Twitter, whatever you continue to want to call it. <laughs> We're going to leave it there. Dina, Adam, again, thank you both so much. Really appreciate the time and your thought leadership. I'll see you both next month. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.